Um, I'm going to start by just showing you this. Everybody recognize what this is, right? No, it's not the new iPad. It's not as cool as that. It's not the old trusty iPad 2. But I think all of you agree that Apple probably is one of the most iconic and transformative company in our age. And you will ask, why is it so successful? And to borrow you know, Steve Jobs' word, because it's insanely successful in leveraging its creative Chris, capital. That was great. Yeah. And the question you may ask, well, terrific. what are the creative capitals that, that we are dealing with? Well, I think for today's talk, you have heard a lot about the artistic side of the creative capital. And from the last talk from Melanie, you also learned that there are other people who are also can be creative. And I, what I want to do is actually broaden that, that group in, oops, who is the clicker, sorry. <laughs> Forget about the clicker, playing with the prop. So, so those are artists, and I want to broaden that definition to include scientists, mathematicians, engineers, entrepreneurs, as well as teachers, anybody who basically develop, transform, and exchange great ideas. I think those are the creative class. Now, next thing is, well, when you're dealing with creating new product or creating great ideas in a creative economy, I would argue that what are the two important ingredients which are basically uh, necessary. I would say that there is one, it's called a scientific method, as a scientist, I would say that. And then the other one, I would call the aesthetic approach. And in some sense, both of them are needed to transform great ideas, new technologies, and valuable resources to something which is accessible at the human scale. Okay. Now, what is in a scientific toolbox? So I'm a scientist, so you know, you may ask, when a scientist faces a particular problem or challenge, what are we good for, okay? Now, when you are faced with those kind of problems, scientists are very good in identifying a set of key questions that would address the problem, and they will formulate a set of hypotheses which would address that problem, and what is most important is the fact that scientists do experiments, calculations, and try to verify those hypotheses. And the cycle complete, if you look at observations from the experiment, if it disagree with what the hypothesis is, then you will go back and refine your hypothesis. And that refining process continues, right, in, in, a, in a cyclical way. Now, the scientific method has been very successful in bringing our, our society with new understanding in science, new technologies, so nobody is going to dispute that. But what I'm trying to argue at this point is, is the fact that those kind of problem-solving skills can be extended into other realms outside of science. Now, what is in the other toolbox? Um, the aesthetic approach that I call, if, if you actually think about it, it's really an insight-driven process for intellectual inquiry. So you ask the same question again. A good artist, what, a, what would they approach a particular problem or challenge? What are they good at doing is basically seeing the different linkage, let's say historical, societal, political, cultural, religious, or even including scientific connections to a particular problem. And they are able to basically see the significance for those linkage to other signposts in culture or in time. And what they can also do very good at doing is actually creating and distilling still observation into something, a product or art piece that can resonate in time. Now, if you think about good art, what would they, you know, what are, what are the characteristics of that? Good art always create a resonance in a, in a culture. And it basically eventually transformed into a signpost itself that will bring cultural awareness to the original problem at hand. Okay, now when you say the two different ways that we approach different problems, so the two threats of intellectual inquiry, do they you know, interact or do they kind of separate independently? I argue that they actually do not interact independently. They basically form a creative DNA for a creative economy. As an example with Apple products again, right? There are a bunch of engineers, there are a bunch of artists working on the product, on, on the product but Obviously, they understand the scientific and the technological idea behind it to actually create this product. But most importantly, they actually have an aesthetic understanding of how humans interact. Right? 
they also can foresee how those new technology can enhance our interactions. That's why they're so successful. Now, here is a quote by Albert Einstein. Where we face the world as free beings, admiring, asking, and observing, there we enter the realm of art and science. And recently, as you can see from you know, today's talks, there are a lot of increasing attention played to the importance of the creative class. And in particular, uh, one of the talk earlier this morning, we talked about the fact that local community, local business leader, they actually start seeing the compounding benefit from using the creative resources that we have in the city for our economy. But we also heard a lot of people talking about the fact that if you're looking about career development program in particular, for the creative class, in particular for my own particular perspective, in the visual art are still very limited. And in some sense, the Hamiltonian artists, the organization I created on U Street and 14th Street is really my own personal journey in trying to bridge that gap by borrowing a well-established career development idea in science and borrowing some additional idea from commercial enterprises and building and developing a social enterprise network that would support the emerging artists. So the product basically is transforming this space on 14th Street into, into, wait a minute, okay, there you go, into basically this new green sustainable art space which contain an art gallery, also an art professional program, and all encompassed into a real estate development project. Okay. Now, throughout this journey, one thing that I gained the most insight from is really, uh, in order for you to make your project to have the greatest impact, you have to take a personal stake in it. You, what you need to do, you cannot just basically be a passive supporter of the creative class. You actually have to become an active enabler for the creative class. You have to create a structure for them to sustain. Now, in, in some sense, I'm kind of going ahead of what I want to say, and then now let me go backtrack to the point where I was just finishing up my PhD, so it's this freshly minted PhD student from grad school. And there is a well-established um, professional development structure to set up for scientists. It's called a doctoral training program. If you think about as a scientist in science, you don't just go out to a university and say, I want a job as a professor after you finish your PhD. Well, probably, likely, probably you wouldn't get it. So typically what happens is, you know, you will work with a professor or a scientist, more established scientist in a university or a research group, like a national lab, that would help you, mentor you, through the process, and then you will learn to be a professor you, as well as you will learn to kind of fine tune your scientific training. For me, I thought that was a very productive and very uh, uh, educational process in my own scientific career. And when I uh, go back, looking at it as, a, as an artist myself, um, after some years of teaching, I want to actually go back into the art community. And I was saying, well, what can I do with my own experience in trying to benefit the art community. I was saying that maybe I want to replicate the same postdoctoral training program for art, I would call it postdoc in art, for the art community, for emerging artists in particular. As in one of the uh, speakers earlier speak today, really what the support should be, should be an importing side of the equation, should be setting up structure to support artists instead of bringing artists into the city. Okay, now when you look at uh, the program that I set up, uh, in the postdoctoral research side as a scientist, what are the main ingredients? It's the mentorship program, right? It's the, it's the fact that you're actually working with a more established artist that can help you to hone your scientific skills, as well as you learn to be a professor. That's, a, that's an important part. And the other one is the fact that you're actually still working with a group of postdocs, scientists in the same stage, going through the same process, it gives you critical feedback in how that process should go and how you actually can gain entrance into a very competitive community. Now, the other one is the fact that as a professional scientist or professional artist, you need to get your work out there. You, mean you need to talk about your scientific finding. You need to talk about you know, what you have discovered. You need to show your art pieces. You need to talk about your artistic concept to other people. You, as a professional 
artist or scientist, you need to have the ability to go out and do that. When I think back, you know, as a scientist, the postdoctoral research paper is one of the best time in some sense in my life. So you finish your school so that you're no longer, uh, you know, under academic stress. You're free to do your own research, right? And, um, but at the same time, you get a support from your mentor in providing financial support as well as, and as, as, well as uh, uh, scientific pointers in sending you out to other conferences and meetings to talk about your art. So which is very similar to what we have set up for our program. We provide a world-class exhibition space on 14 and U Street and give our fellows the opportunity to show their work, let other community, other art, artists to see their work. And public exposure is one of the key points that I think the fact that we have chosen the space where we are on 14 and U. Oops, sorry. Oh, sorry. Uh, now, the other part that I think that is very different between a postdoc and a student, if you think about a PhD student, is the fact that when you're a student, you learn about the science. Just like when you talk about artists, when they're in, M M in, a, F F in a MFA program, they learn about artistic concepts and art theories. But after they finish the school, one thing that's important to move into the second stage is really learning to be a professional artist or become a professor. So in a postdoctoral research period, you learn from your mentor to be a professor. You, you learn how to write a grant. You learn how to present your work in a public setting. You, know, you learn how to deal with university administrators. And you learn how to teach students. Right? You learn how to train the next generation. You learn how to run a lab. Obviously, for the artist, it will be different sets of skills. You, know, you will learn how to run a business. You will learn how to um, deal with taxes. You will learn how to deal with legal issues. So there are different things, but it's still an important criterion is a professional development, which is, I think is lacking in the DC community in terms of training the next generation of artists. And obviously, you know, as an artist or as a scientist, you're producing work, you're discovering things. We have a duty to actually give back. We have to talk about our art, talk about our science, so that other people can benefit from this, right? Now, in particular, um, I think the one of the main thing that I want the fellows from our program to actually understand is the fact that when they are done, they should see that they are only part of a bigger creative fabric of the city. They will be artists. There's no way around that. They will produce work, and actually, we encourage them to continue to produce work and to exhibit which is by nature, that's what artists do. But they should also see that the fact that if they are going to be an educator, let's say they're going to teach schools, if they're going to work in a creative economy company, let's say Apple work designing Apple products, or other kind of creative jobs, they also need to see that the creative energy has to go beyond the gallery confine. Right? They have to learn the fact that the aesthetic approach that is so good in doing artwork can be applied. Those tools that can be applied outside of what the gallery permit them to do. Um, let's see. Now, I'm glad to be actually at the right time uh, at the area where 14 and U Street are renovating. Uh, I'm glad that Hamiltonian artists can be a part of the uh, cultural uh, re renaissance in that area. And what I want you to come, oops, not quite showing so well. What I want you to come out with this talk with a quote is the following. So every single human being is creative. The biggest challenge of the creative age is to lift the bottom up and encourage a prosperous, vibrant, and sustainable community for all. And I hope that as a creative entrepreneur, you and I, we feel the need to say that we have a duty and we do have a task to become an enabler for the creative class. We need to be an active participant of building structure to support them. So those are the, the fellows from the program so far. And um, I'm hoping that they will also, through this process, see the fact that they will be part of the creative economy and their role in this creative economy is is broader than what they have trained as, a, as an artist in, the, in school. So, thank you very much.